Hello, guys and gals, and this is part 11 of our reading of Pandora's Jeans. This is a book by Catherine Lance, and this is an original 1985 copy that I found at a thrift store. Now, um, if you like this book and you want to read it yourself or read it along with me, then um, most book retailers have this book. The second book of the trilogy called Pandora's Children and the third book of the trilogy Pandora's Promise. And like I say, most of the big retailers will have this book, I'm sure. Anyways, as always, we're going to go over the copyright information first. Now, I do have the author's permission to read this book on my channel. Um, copyright 1985 by Catherine Lance, and it says all rights reserved, but I do have the author's permission to read this. So, anyways, in the last book, there... Um, Evie was um, initiated into um, the scientists' guild or whatever, you know. And um, there was an outlaw attack that um, she fended off with the help of Baby, her um, fox cat. At least one of the women is dead. Um, died in the attack. But um, we are going to continue reading this. In spite, in spite of the months of drills, in spite of the fact that the women had in fact won the battle, every, Evie knew that the silence in the room and the sorrowful, strained expressions that such an attack had never really been expected by most of the women, except perhaps those few who had been trained as soldiers. Lucky, who Evie knew had been stationed at the other end of the lodge, was pale in a chalky, sick looking way, and she was clinging to Lucille as if she had become a child again. Suddenly, Evie remembered Zack's struggle with the highwayman on the bridge and wondered if he had been frightened then, as she had been tonight and had forced herself to act in spite of fear, simply because it had to be done. The door opened again and Katha entered with her deputy, Kim. In front of them were two securely bound and bloody men. Katha herself was wounded, her right arm loosely bandaged and seeping blood, but she seemed not to notice. She pushed the men into the center of the room where they fell, groaning. Her face was so twisted with anger that she was almost unrecognizable. Three, three more are dead, she said. The rest escaped. She turned to the men. Evie could see now that they were uncommonly dirty. Their long hair and beards ungroomed and tangled. One of them was grinning foolishly, and Evie's heart lurched as she recognized a man who had attacked her earlier. Baby, sitting in her lap, began growling as she tightened her arms around her pet, whispering, Shh! Who are you? Katha asked the men on the floor. Poor wanderers, said the grinning man. Twelve heavily armed men are not, are not common wan wanderers, Katha said. Why did you attack us? The man shrugged. You'll answer now, Katha said. She kicked the pointed toe of her boot into the man's groin. With a grunt, he doubled over and lay there, wriggling and gasping. Katha turned to the other man. I can kick you too, she said. With your stomach wound, it might kill you. Will you tell me who you are? Kill me then, the man said, his eyes taking on a crazed look. Kill us both. You can't kill the truth. What nonsense is this? asked Katha. She was about to kick the man ag again when Gunda laid a hand on her shoulder. Let it go till morning, said Gunda. The you're wounded. Katha shook her head. I'm all right. And she said, but Evie thought she looked pale and sick, and her face was wet. Who sent you here? Katha asked the first man. Her voice noticeably weaker. She kicked him again, and Evie turned her head. She didn't know how the man could stand the pain and still not say anything, but the look in his eyes was that of a madman. Perhaps he didn't he did not feel anything, not really. At, at last, Katha gave up looking disgusted and a little frightened. You'll tell us what we want to know tomorrow, she said. She ordered the men locked into the root cellar for the night. In the morning, the prisoners were found dead, both hanged by their belts. On the floor, scratched in the dirt over an over and over until it made a deep furrow was a sign of a double spiral. The next day, the principal arrived with his troops. 
Number seven. A chilling dawn mist turned the principal's breath white as he squatted just outside his tent, sipping herb tea. To the east, splinters of light sparkled on the lake. Around him, the trees and brush were thick with red and brown leaves. He had scarcely slept all night despite fatigue from the week-long journey. Despite the exhaustion of setting up camp for more than 200 men, the clearing was now thickly set with tents and and hazy with smoke from early morning campfires. It had been 14 months since Zack's disappearance, and he felt as if he had aged 10 years in that time. He stood, his knees creaking, and settled his cloak about his shoulders, and motioned to Daniel, the young general. I'll go alone, he said, keeping his voice low. I don't know how long I'll, I'll be. Prepare for action, but do nothing. Come after me only if I don't return by nightfall. The, young, the younger man seemed about to speak, no doubt, to urge the armed, an armed escort, but simply nodded. Daniel, like all the principal's men, had learned what, what came of arguing once the principal had decided on a course of action. The principal started up the familiar steep trail, his leather boots slipping on the wet yellow leaves. His mouth was as dry as if he had spent the night in spent the night in drinking, and his breath came heavily by the time he reached the top. He felt a physical jolt when the garden appeared. Its sheer bulk was still overwhelming, and though the wall seemed shorter and less imposing than he recalled, a rush of memories flooded his mind. He had heard the, that the leaders had arisen from among the younger women, yet in, in his mind's eye he saw the old women the old woman, rather, her white lab coat fluttering behind her, directing everything herself from the work rosters to the choice of plants and animals to be crossed in breeding experiments. She must be very old by now, he thought, and though he knew he had nothing to fear from her, his stomach clenched when he thought of the inevitable confrontation. There was two sleepy-looking guards at the gate. The older of them, a black girl of perhaps twenty, opened her mouth in fright when she saw him. Her hand reached for her sword, but she stopped as his voice rang out. Tell your mayor that the principal is here, he said. Go. I won't enter till you return. With a frightened glance backward, the second guard, a oh, guard, little older than a child, followed the first. He grimaced in disgust, clearly, he had made the right decision. Ill-trained, skittish women could not be trusted to guard the most valuable outpost of his empire. Presently, a tall, strong-looking young woman with thick, blonde braids, wearing armor of leather, strode towards the gate. Her right arm was in a sling and left just the left just touching her sword, a museum piece made of polished bronze. Behind her were two other smaller women. I'm Katha, mayor of the garden, she said. What do you want? Do you know who I am, he asked. You are the principal, or so you told the guard. From the look of you, I have no reason to doubt it. I repeat, what do you want? Her tone set his teeth on edge, bringing back dark memories. He wanted to strike her down and march in over her body. He took three slow, deep breaths and said, We have come to evacuate you. The district is under attack by barbarians from the west. We know about the barbarians, said Cat, said Katha evenly, and we thank you for your offer. But there is no need. We can defend ourselves. If all of them were, were like her, the principal thought, they, they no doubt could. I've packed, I've picked out a site for your, for you near the capital. We want, he went on, if you don't like it, you may choose another. I will give you as many men as you need help to move your things and to rebuild. We will not leave, she said. Again, the principal had to hold his anger. Unless this place has greatly changed, she said, this is not something that you can decide yourself. Call a council together and let me speak. The, w the woman gazed at him for a moment, her hazel eyes showing a flicker of what, what might be fear. She nodded. Very well. It will be this evening. You are you alone will be our guest of guest for dinner. Afterwards, we will talk. I'll return at sunset, he said then. One more thing. I must see the mistress. That's impossible. Tell her I asked 
It is for her to decide. Again, the woman nodded, and he turned away. He turned aware that the struggle had only begun. The interior compound was far larger than when he had seen it last, with more shelters. Although some of the original buildings still stood, the garden to the west was in darkness, but the, f the fading light showed the old laboratory and the animal pens as they had been. The largest building, a long, low structure of hewn logs, stood where the old, smaller dormitories had been. It had it had three large windows with panes of oiled sheepskin and an ornately carved lintel above the wide doorway. The building was impossibly large, or impossibly bigger than any new structure in the, in the capital. Its window, its window frames and neatly shingled roof as carefully wrought as if it had been constructed before the change, just behind and to the side was a more crudely made tiny cabin with faint light shining be behind worn, familiar shutters. He looked away from the cabin and sucked in air, willing it to cool the bubble of nausea in his chest. He would remain calm. He would not allow these women to know how deeply he was affected by being here. The door was opened by Katha herself. He was almost overwhelmed by the concentrated human smell of women and children. Conversation stopped as he entered. Then, a moment later, a high-pitched buzz of voices began again. He felt as if he had entered a hive of alien insects, all darting about or hovering above wooden perches. He sat at a bench, Katha indicated, and gratefully accepted a, a cup of warm brew, gulping at it to clear his head. The girl who had brought it was no more than sixteen, but she already had the hand the hard, worried look of a woman who grew up in the garden. A casual glance around the room showed more of the same competent, tough, and deadly females. These were more capable than any before in history. The principle was sure, even in the days before the change, when women had been equal in number to men and, incredible, and, and incredibly had held leadership positions alongside them. Such a thing could never again be, of course, but he had to admit that the women of the garden had proved they were at least capable of ruling themselves. He held his cup, more, cup for more brew, and Katha raised an eyebrow. I see you like our ale. We make it from a new grain we've developed recently. The principal forced his mind to remain steady against the irrational fear of new plants and animals, the terror of wild Dinas personified in the nightmares of children. It was all nonsense, of course, but the principal had always understood why so many of his population feared anything that smacked of science. Anyone who had seen a poison bat or a new goat could only sh shudder at the, the small invisible monsters that created such deadly charge changes. No wonder two generations of incorporated fear of Dinas into the ancient religion. No wonder two generations had incorporated fear of Dinas into the ancient regions. Oh, no, re religions, sorry. With the idea of contamination by Dinas still in the back of his mind, the principal made an effort to establish conversation. I see, I see things have changed very little, he said. We've grown in numbers, said Katha. Most of the women you see here are the senior council, with younger women and children, and those who live outside the compound. We are 126 altogether. Of course, in the most important ways, we haven't changed at all, as you will find out. He looked carefully at her. Was she trying to provoke him? Her face told, told him nothing. She went on in the same calm tone. I relayed your request to our mistress. She always dines alone in her quarters, but she will see you after dinner. The principal nodded at mention of the old woman. His nausea had returned, and he fought an impulse to walk out to return to the capital and let the garden and all around it be overrun by barbarians. He drained the second cup of brew. You must be very thirsty from your journey, said Katha. Again, he looked at her sharply, but said nothing, although none of the of the perhaps two dozen others had yet addressed him directly. He felt conspicuous 
aware of the many eyes in the room examining him, as if he were a specimen under one of their microscopes. No doubt hating him for what they had heard about him, he realized with a sudden shock that many of the women here, perhaps as many as half a dozen, were pregnant. That had been rare in the old days. There, there was something obscene about so many gravid women with no men around. Just as Katha announced dinner, there was a commotion in the kitchen, and he heard a scrabbling, sliding sound, followed by a high-pitched laughter. He watched in astonishment as a fat, furry animal came skittering out after a piece of sliced carrot, both of them colliding with the screen in front of the fire. The principal gaped. Is that a fox cat? The first tame one we've ever seen, said Katha. It was raised by one of our new members. Lisa put baby out. The girl who had been serving brew set down her pitcher and approached a small animal, beckoning and clucking. The principal watched in fascination as the tame fox cat was was important news and that it had been accomplished here was all the more reason to move the women to safety. It soon became apparent that the little animal didn't want to go outside. Whenever Lisa would get close to it, the fox cat moved sideways or backwards, always just out of reach, and the other women were smiling, hiding laughter with their hands as Lisa became even more frustrated. Even the principal was amused, although slightly uneasy whenever the animal came near it near him. Lisa took a piece of cheese from the tray on the mantelpiece and held it enticingly to the fox cat. It approached, sniffing at her outstretched fingers, then suddenly, leaping into the air, turning completely around and scampering under the massive wooden table at the far end of the room. Dinas, take your baby, said Lisa. Ev Evie, come get your pet, she called to the kitchen. After a moment, another girl emerged from the kitchen and swiftly knelt to the floor just in front of the, of the kitchen door, her dark hair hiding her face. The principal turned to watch as, he, as the girl scooped the fox cat up in her arms, then turned back to the kitchen. Sorry for that diversion. Oh, sorry that the, the diversion had ended. He held his cup for more brew, and then he felt something that made his hair on the back of his neck stand up. The sensation was so, was so strong that he could not help but turn his head, and his eyes met those of the young girl. She was outstanding in the doorway of the kitchen, holding the fox cat to her chest and gazing at him with a frightened, frightening intensity. Her eyes were the color of plums, and her face was so lovely it made the principal dizzy. When she met his eyes, it was like it was with a look of, of recognition, and he knew that she knew him, but not how. She turned and slipped into the kitchen, but even with, with the when the door was shut, the principal felt her presence in the room. Kathy gave him a, a curious look as she refilled his cup, but said nothing. His heart was racing as if he had just ridden at top speed. He thought of dozens of questions to ask, all casual, all seemingly innocent, and all brutally o obvious. He said nothing. He ate his dinner, a roasted new fowl, vegetable stew, and baked roots, quickly without tasting it. His metal cup was refilled more times than he could count with the sweet, the Swedish flower wine he remembered, and, the, and there seemed to be much conversation and laughter throughout the meal, although he scarcely listened. Hilda, a pale middle-aged woman who was the chief farmer, questioned him about growing conditions and the new plants and animals near the capital. He answered her automatically, scarcely registering the possible significance of the question. His mind was fixed on the extraordinary young girl. No matter what the outcome of the council meeting tonight, no matter how he evacuated the women, be it voluntary or through force, no matter if the fate of the entire district depended on it, the principal was determined of one thing. He had to have that girl. So focused was his thoughts that he had trouble bringing his mind to the business at hand when Katha rose and said, I'll take you to, now to see the mistress. The old woman, he'd almost forgotten about her. The food in his stomach churned. Then, uh, this evening was an unsettling as 
long nights of dreams and nightmares. First, the beautiful young girl, and now the old woman. Perhaps a bargain could be worked out. Even as the thought sprang to his mind, he knew that it was impossible, that the very last place on earth he could bargain for a girl was among the women of the garden. He would have to take her some other way, by by a trick, perhaps, or by force, but take her he would. He filled the... He filled his chest deep, deeply with the chill night air as they approached the door of the old woman's cabin. Katha knocked and, in response to a quiet come in, opened the door. The principal is here, mistress, Katha said. She was sitting on a chair by the fire, a blue-spined book in her hands. The principal felt nothing when he saw her, only surprised that she was so old. None of the anticipated rage appeared. None uh, of the hatred. He approached her slowly and inclined his head. Good evening, old woman, he said. The mistress looked up. Welcome home, Will, she said. Okay. Chapter 8. It was almost as if he had never left. There was a sense of familiarity so total that it was displayed as formality. Whenever, whatever feelings they had once held for each other now lay buried beneath the conventions. I congratulate you, she said. You've done everything you set out to do. Almost everything. The most important part of my plan still depends on your work. He glanced about the tiny cluttered room, the shadows, the furnishings, the faint odor at once, the faint odor at once stale and faintly spicy. All were exactly as they had been nearly 20 years ago. I've been expecting this for some time, she said quietly, but not you personally. I wanted to accompany, I wanted to accomplish the evacuation without force. I didn't think you would listen to anybody but me, he paused, Th then, ha then had to say it. Zack is missing, probably dead. I know, she said without changing expression. He stated how, how could she know, plainly, she wasn't going to tell him, but the accusation in her eyes told him that she held him in some way responsible. The Dinas take her. I've postponed the move as long as I could, he said. These rebels, or whatever they are, are spreading. Refugees are beginning to come, in, come into the capital, especially from this area. I can't leave you here, so close to the border. And the garden will make you an, impregn an impregnable fortress. You've only been waiting for an excuse to take it. He shook his head in annoyance. It's true that this place serves my purpose better than, than an army post, but that's not the point. Protecting your work is the, is the important thing. Since I deposed the president, there's been no need for you to stay in such a remote area. What if we refuse to go? I have an army of over 200 men. Will you kill, kill us all then and destroy our work? You would never let that happen. It's not up to me, she said, her eyes flashing. I know better, he said. I know that there is, that if you talk to the women and explain why they must go, they will do as you, they will do as you ask. And you know, and you know it too. The old woman sat silent for several minutes. Finally, she spoke. Two nights ago, we fought off the most serious attack in decades. We are more capable than you imagine, but I'm beginning to fear that we haven't the resources to be both scientists and warriors. You'll persuade the council? I, can, I can't be sure all the women will agree, Katha in particular, but not likely to give, up, give, give in easily. But I'll speak to them. He relaxed. Thank you. Thank the Dinas. I would not come to a fight up, up until this very moment. He had not... It would, not, it would not come to a fight. Up until this very moment, he had not been certain how she would react. They sat in silence a moment. The old woman looked very tired. How did you learn about Zack, he asked. What, what I know and how I know it is no concern of yours, she said. His face flushed with instant anger. He stood and walked to the other end of the room, breathing deeply, aware of her eyes on him. He touched some of the articles in her laboratory table, an ancient microscope, a precious glass flask, some tiny sharp metal knives. I will stay and supervise the transition. 
he said, not looking at her. Then I must return to the capital. My men are camped in the clearing at the bottom of the hill. He paused a moment, not certain exactly what he was going to say next. My men are well disciplined, he said. Then I'll instruct them to leave the women alone, but I can't be responsible for their actions, for the, react, for the actions of the women. Let me worry about the women, she said, and be very sure about one thing. You will have none of them ever. Do you understand? My men will do as I say. I wasn't talking about your men, she flashed him a look so chilling that for a moment he was back in the garden as he remembered it, a young boy in a prison run by strict women with beasts with breasts and abdomens like pillows, an unwanted slave who would never be given the key to the mysteries locked in the rooms in their rooms and bodies. The long-ago fear turned to a hatred so intense it brought him suddenly to himself. Have no fear, old woman, he said, returning his look. Your little flowers are safe for me, for as long as you live, he thought, and from the look of you, that won't be long. And then, well, he was, he was the principal. He had all the resources of the district behind him, and within his own laws, nothing could prevent him from taking the girl with the plum-colored eyes. The council was the council was little changed from the meeting he had witnessed as a young boy watching from behind windows or past or partly closed doors. There, the oh, there were more women here now than there were than there was the same spirit of chaos, the high pitched excitement and arguing of every view. The result was that it took hours to decide a matter. That should have taken. That should have been settled in one by one bold decision, as the old woman woman had predicted. The strongest voice in opposition to the move was that of Katha. He could almost sympathize with her as she watched her rule, watched her rule slipping away. We're going to have to stop that here. We have been reading from Pandora's Jeans, and if you like this book and want to get yourself a copy, then most of the big Book retailers will probably have it, along with the sequel, Pandora's Children, and the the third book of the trilogy, Pandora's Ch um, Promise. And if you like this content, then make sure you like and subscribe, ring the bell so you know when I so you know when I upload. Also, if you want to support me in any way, all the information will be in the description below. As always, thanks for watching, everyone, and have a great day.